Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment, EBSCO, and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I am the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's for event. Our topic today is the Folio Roadmap. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel and to the resources section of folio.org. As an open forum, participants can see participants' names and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speaker will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Harry Kapanian, Senior Director of Product Management and Software Services at EBSCO. So with that, I will turn it over to Harry. Hello, everyone. And uh, just quick overview, um, we'll be discussing the roadmap or rather the roadmap process that Folio uses on a day-to-day -day basis to manage work that gets done. And then from there, we'll jump into a demonstration of Folio functionality as well. Um, and again, um, please post your questions in chat and we'll be happy to take a look and answer as we can. So for starters, um, we've got a long list of features. Um, if any of you have worked on an RFP um, or a tender or anything similar, um, these tend to be very long lists of features that libraries expect a system to be able to support. And really, Folio is no different. Um, in fact, there are four or five features um, that the community expects Folio to support, really at a minimum. And one of the issues, of course, is we can't do everything simultaneously. Um, when you're developing software, you really have to pick and choose what goes first. And that can be quite a chore when you've got this many items. And so our process overall um, as a community is to really focus on libraries that are intending on adopting and making use of Folio. And so one of the things we've done is we've taken all these features and you're looking at a spreadsheet here. And this actually represents a survey that went out to the early adopter libraries uh, that we know of that are actively involved in the project. And you can see the libraries here, um, Bremen, GBV, HBZ, Chalmers, Chicago, University of Chicago, Cornell, the five colleges consortia here in New England, um, Lehigh University, Texas A&M, and University of Alabama. And what we did was we asked the libraries to go through and rank these features as critical for go live. Can they wait until the fiscal year rollover? Can they wait a quarter after go live up to a year? Are they even needed at all? And again, the idea of giving us a really good understanding of what these early adopter libraries need. And so they've all spent a considerable amount of time going through and prioritizing these. And it's really interesting to see because it does give us some pretty good insight on the different needs of the libraries. Um, but at the same time, it helps overall and prioritize. Uh, these were all given um, a score or a value, or at least the choices in terms of their answers were given a value. And what we noticed was there are certain features that really are predominantly chosen by um, almost all the libraries. Um, there are features that are not chosen, and that really helps a lot in terms of our decision-making process. And so we took all of this, and we have what we call our capacity planning document, where we're able to go through, and those ranks were totaled up from that previous spreadsheet, and they end up here with the features with values. Now, the values and the priorities we got are from the libraries, and this is absolutely critically important, but oftentimes in the real world, when you're trying to build a piece of software, um, sometimes those priorities have to change due to technical dependencies or technical issues or 
pieces of infrastructure that may have to be built. And so the way we operate in Folio, we have a group of people that we call the product owners. And these product owners have the key responsibility of working with the librarians and the special interest groups to help flesh out the requirements of what the software needs to do, while at the same time working with the software development, development teams working on the project to help flesh out any requirements from the technical back end, but also gain an overall understanding as far as what makes sense in terms of what we can build and when. And so what happens, of course, is the product owners then come in and provide yet another round of priorities. And we basically take a look at these and from that really come up with the overall priority in terms of what gets built first and what happens next. Now, another added piece we add here, of course, is um, we have a fairly significant group of development teams that are working to build Folio. And if we take a look at here, uh, columns J and forward, um, here we see the different development teams um, as they're known on the project by name. And we're able to take a look at the number of, or the amount of developer effort that they're able to contribute to the project to building out features and functionality. And these are based on days, and these actually split up as far as front end and back end developers on the project. Because in many cases, some of the developers have um, specific skill sets that apply to certain parts of the project. And we're able to document what they actually have available, what the plan is to apply them to in terms of features. And these are the numeric values that you see spread out here. And then what the spreadsheet does, it takes a look at that and it starts to just based on a very simple calculation shows us what do we believe we can deliver in the current quarter, which is what appears in green. What are the things that we believe we can build in the next and upcoming quarter, which would be Q1 and those are the items in yellow and then further on down um, you start to see some of the items that are in red um, which means most likely those won't happen until after q1 of next year now what we do is we go through on a quarterly basis and we go back and um, adjust the priorities um, because new features are added or some features are removed because they've been completed. And this allows the early adopter libraries to go in and provide another additional round of feedback. And then we go back to our capacity plan. And if you take a look, there are previous capacity plans that exist here on the tabs, um, earlier previous versions of the document. And we go through and we create these updates. And again, helping us provide a picture or an understanding as far as what we can work on and what we can't. And of course, as new developers or development teams get added to the project, they get added to the column. And that certainly has a really nice impact in terms of what appears green and what appears yellow. Um, in addition, um, this is a spreadsheet. This has to be updated fairly often, although it is actually tied to JIRA. And JIRA is actually what we use project-wise to manage our features. And so all those features that you saw on that list on that spreadsheet actually come out of this JIRA database. And all these tickets really represent all the features that need to be worked on. And it shows us the status of the different features. And so, for instance, here we see um, features that are open, meaning these are features that are needed in this first column, but we need requirements for. Um, the ones that are in PO analysis, which is the next column, these are features where product owners are actively working with the special interest groups and the developers to flesh out all the requirements that are required so development team can actually start to work on it. And ideally getting to the point where the SIGs, the developers, everyone basically approve of the features, what's expected out of those features, um, the acceptance criteria for a feature being finished, and any overall planning that's required to get it built. And these are the ones that appear in this column, PO analysis complete. Um, they're essentially development ready. And ideally from there, the development teams are then able to pull these features actually into this next column and they physically do pull these because you can actually move these um, i'm not going to do that now and then ideally from development moving into testing 
and then review to checking for completeness. We also have a column here for blocked because what happens is sometimes as we get into a feature, we realize there may be a dependency that either we didn't realize or sometimes even prior to starting actual development, we know and understand there are dependencies. And so we tend to move those into the column waiting until those dependencies have cleared and we can move them back. And um, if we take a look here real quick, um, we can scroll through and there are quite a lot here. Um, this is open, all, everything I've showed you is really open to the entire universe, anyone that wants to take a look at this. Um, JIRA does require a login and password, and um, that's just the way JIRA works. Um, however, anyone can register with JIRA, request a login, and you can get one. And so anyone on the call is entitled to get one as well as folks not on the call. And so if you go in, um, you can go in, take a look at these boards. As you can see, we have a pretty extensive set of filters here. And so for instance, if we're interested in the batch importer, we can select that and see the status. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of work um, going on in terms of analysis. Um, development is about to start, um, but uh, there are others we can take a look at. For instance, loans or loan rules and so on, and we can get a good picture of what's going on. Um, in addition, uh, we do have uh, a, ser uh, a series of dashboards that we try to use to track overall progress. And here I'm going into the Q4 2018 dashboard, and this provides us some of the, um, the basic stats. And um, here, for example, um, a, a pie chart um, showing us um, the status. Uh, we've got 106 total issues that we're hoping to tackle in this quarter. And this gives us a pretty good idea of what the percentage is in terms of how we're tracking against our goals. We also have what we call our non-functional requirements that we track in JIRA as well. And as you can see, we can track these as well. Um, here we have the features, um, but aligned or organized based on the epics that they're tied to. And epics typically represent a collection of features and functionality or stories, um, or in many ways they might almost be described as domains of expertise in many cases within the library. And we can see the breakdown there as well. And also um, uh, taking a look at the features, but taking a look at how those features are spread out across the different development teams as well that are working on Folio. Um, here we can take a look at, again, the different development teams, more of a two-dimensional chart of um, what they're working on. Um, everything here is essentially hyperlinked, so you can click on any of these and get to the actual list of, for example, features that the Thunderjet team is working on. Same here, everything is live. Um, here we can take a look at some of the blocked features um, and the status of those. And again, here we're now taking a look at statistics across um, individual product owners and in some cases, even some developers as well. Um, let's see. In addition, um, we could go in into JIRA and, for example, take a look at an individual feature or an individual story, or in this case, an epic. And here we can see where we've actually transferred all the priorities based on the survey into here as well. So any product owner, developer, anyone who's working within JIRA can see these. Um, and looking back at uh, this, um, at any time, anyone can go in and take a look at a particular feature. And here we see more of the details about this feature as well. That's essentially how we track our priorities or how we make sure we're prioritized and all aligned and all working on the things that we need to work on, ideally to get a library live. Uh, we're focusing on attempting to get a first library 
up and running or as close as possible to up and running in the first quarter of next year. Um, and ideally that will be the library when we take a look at the actual survey that I hate to say this, but actually needed the least in terms of getting up and running. Um, the community, um, the Folio community has deemed it critically important to get a library up and running as quickly as possible because we look at all these features and we believe all these features are critically important. Um, but the reality is um, Folio is a new and different piece of software. It doesn't necessarily work like the software that's in existence today. And so a lot of the features oftentimes that are requested are based on past experience versus an understanding of the software that's being built. And so if we can get a library running on the software that's in the process of being built, that becomes our best learning experience in terms of understanding what's really critical, what's really important. We may find some of the features that we deem critically important based on past experience may not necessarily be needed or may not be as important as we start to learn and understand how we can use the new software to solve our problems and get work done. And so this is a critical priority for us as far as the project is concerned. And just real quick, I don't see any questions. So I'm assuming it's okay to move on. And let me get that ready. One moment here. Okay, so this is um, a fairly current version of Folio. Um, we're in between releases now, um, which means this snapshot um, that represents code or working code um, is, well, it's not exactly what we'd release at the end of the quarter. And what that also means is there are developers and development teams actively working on code. So we tend to be in a period of less stability right now than more stability. Um, but that's okay. Um, there's easily enough here where we can show and demonstrate and talk about the software. Um, for starters, Again, taking a look at users or the management of users. Um, we've got all sorts of filtering here where we can take a look at the different users within the system. In Folio, users, patrons, they're really all one and the same. It just comes down to what rights and privileges do they have within the system and what features can they access within the system. The assumption is if you're a typical patron or a student, you probably have access to nothing within what represents the back office or front desk operations within Folio, really the only thing you'd be able to interact with is the discovery service that would be interacting with Folio. But anyone that's added can be given additional rights. So if we need student helper maybe to run the front desk or at least a process book drop or something like that, those sorts of things can be easily set up and configured. Um, we can uh, search here. And so I can search for a particular individual. I can click on it. Here I see details about the user. Um, we've got the structure that we call the accordion that helps save some screen space and hopefully allowing a library to focus on the pieces of data that are at least most important initially. Um, but we can, of course, expand all of these, take a look at the details of what's here. Um, we can, of course, edit the user at any time by popping in here and making changes. Um, Folio does support the concept of proxies or sponsorships. And so, for instance, um, this person is an undergrad, um, but I can set them up as a proxy, let's say, for a particular faculty member. And so I can go through here and um, let me see. I can just select faculty. And I'll choose Casey Burge here. And they are now a proxy. Um, 
It's an active relationship. Um, they can request on behalf of the sponsor and any notifications, overdues or anything like that will have set up to the sponsor, um, but they can be sent to the proxy as well. Um, we can also go in and set up an expiration date. And let's say I set up the end of February. And if need be, I can add additional proxies as well. Um, this person can also be a sponsor. Um, in this case, I'm going to update the user so we can use this later. And um, Casey is the person that Tito is acting on behalf of. So if I search for Casey, who I've just added, um, I can go in here and when I look at all the general information about this person, um, we can see here, um, Casey is a sponsor um, of Tito, and uh, which is what we expect it to be. Um, I can also go in now for example, well, let me take a look at inventory real quick. So inventory represents really the catalog um, of what you would expect um, within a library. Um, we've got all sorts of filtering here, language, material type, um, location as well. Um, I'm going to go in and do a search for a particular title, survival. And um, here I've got an item. And well, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> One moment. Oops, wrong location. Let's try that again. Um. At the risk, because something obviously changed since I last tried this. I'm relying on old fashioned paper and pen to write down a barcode. And so for instance, I can then check out. And I'm going to, in this case, I don't have the barcode so of this particular person. So I'm going to look up this person. And um, I believe Tito was the name. Okay. One more try. That should work. Here we go. And so um, Tito Bosco. Folks, I apologize. I mistakenly um, entered in the wrong URL. So let's try this one more time. Here we go, finally, all right. 
So remember, I had set up um, Tito as a proxy on behalf of um, Casey. And so the system recognized that and it now wants to understand, um, is Tito here to borrow on their behalf or is Tito here to borrow on Casey's behalf and I'm going to borrow on Tito's behalf. And same time, I'm going to enter in uh, the barcode that I was looking at earlier and eight, nine, three, seven, seven. Interesting. So I must have typed that in wrong. Let me just choose one of these. Okay. And so that item is on loan. And so now if I go back and take a look at users and I take a look at Tito, and now I can take a look at Tito here and I can see Tito actually has one loan now. And I can go in and take a look at that as well. Um, and now I'm gonna copy this one. And of course I can check in and I can check in and if I just hit enter here, it'll return the item as it was supposed to be returned today, but I also have the ability to process on based on a different day and time. And so if I want to, I could, for instance, backdate these to the first and then I can enter and return that item. And that item is now returned and is now available. Um, at any time, I can end the session to clear the screen. Um, taking a look at inventory again, um, I can take a look at any record here. I see the details here. Um, I can go in and edit as well um, and edit any basic information. Um, all of this translates to what are essentially mark-like fields. Um, I can't show you today but by the end of the quarter, you'll actually be able to see the full-blown mark record editor as well, um, which is actually uh, fairly well on in development and working as well. Um, Folio also has um, an import feature that's currently being worked on. Um, we're able to see the status of import jobs here on the left. We're able to take a look at the job files or log files of data that was loaded. Um, I can drag and drop or choose a particular file that I'm interested in loading in as well. Um, it's not quite finished yet, but in a future iteration, you'll be able to see all the transformation rules and features that are being added to this as well. So data from different sources, um, a mapping can be created, those mappings can be saved and used upon import. Uh, we also um, have uh, the early stages of um, e-resource management here as well. Um, in this case, it's connecting to an external knowledge base or EBSCO's knowledge base live. Um, I can do a search, for example, for ProQuest. Um, here is ProQuest Info and Learning. And um, out of ProQuest total of 853 packages, I have 45 of them selected. Um, these are uh, the different packages that exist uh, within the knowledge base. I can also go through and search for a particular package. In this case, um, I'm gonna search for Academic Search Complete and I can click on it. And here I see more details about the number of titles that are selected within the package. Um, I can, uh, uh, is this um, a package? Are the titles within this package being presented to end users, uh, most likely in a discovery service? Um, do we automatically select new titles as they're added? Um, coverage dates or custom coverage dates, if we had any of them set. And we're also able to take a look at um, the titles that make up this package as well. Uh, I can go in and I can edit and I can change these settings as well. So maybe set this to yes. 
Um, if I want to set up a custom coverage date, um, I can do that as well. I'm not going to. And I can add as many coverage dates as I need to as well. And uh, I'm not going to save that. Continue without saving. Um, I can also uh, search by titles. And so um, survival seems to be the theme here. So I can conduct a search. And maybe here's a journal by Taylor and Francis. Um, this is the information about that particular title. Um, I can add it as a custom package because I can create packages and titles at will as I need to. Um, and these are the different packages where this title is found in case I'm interested in acquiring or gaining access to a package that has that particular title. Um, jump around a little more. Uh, we also have a requests feature and this is where um, holds and um, pages and recalls or at least organized and prioritized and managed within the system um, at uh, any given time. I can take a look at a hold. Um, and here's more of the details about that particular hold. Um, we can make changes if need be. Um, I can also go in and uh, create a new uh, request, whether it be a hold, a page, or a recall, setting up an expiration date, and then entering in the barcode um, of the item and the requester to actually create this. We have um, the early pieces of acquisition starting to come through. And so here we have vendor management. And uh, again, all sorts of filters set up and configurable. Um, based on whatever is needed by the library. Um, I can go in here, for instance, in the Taylor and Francis group, um, see the basic information, again, using that accordion type structure that I can expand. And here we've got contact information. Um, we've got different people that, available that we can contact, agreement information, um, additional uh, vendor information, such as um, payment, claiming information, tax information, the setup and configuration for EDI, FTP, um, the scheduling of EDI and FTP as well, as well as some interface and account information as well. Um, I am not an expert on acquisition, so um, <laughs> I'm going through this briefly and we are limited time, but we can go in, change and modify these as needed and uh, anywhere we need to. Um, there is a finance piece, which is very much um, in progress. And so the screens here are still being updated and still working, uh, being worked on. But for instance, um, taking a look at my ledger, and I've got a relatively crude ledger here, um, along with the funds that are connected to it, um, able to take a look at the different funds. And again, these screens are in the process of being worked on, so they're a little bit um, not as we'd like right now, but they are in process. And um, I can take a look overall um, at my budget. Um, here we can see what's allocated, what's unavailable, what's available. And of course, I can go in and change these as needed as well. And, um, and then I can go in to orders. And again, this isn't complete yet, but is in process. Um, I can create a new order, um, which I won't. I can also click on any particular order to get any sort of details. And um, that's, that's about it. There's uh, currently um, uh, an additional team that's moving on to acquisitions. So we're going to start to see some progress, um, uh, more progress than we have in the past. We're going to start to see this area accelerate in terms of features and functionality. Uh, data import as well as getting some additional development resources. Folio also has this concept of a, of a codex. Um, normally within your automation system, um, typically you're searching the catalog. And the idea is, well, the catalog only represents a certain percentage of your actual collection. 
So in this case, local, which is the catalog and knowledge base, and so we have the ability to search for all. And actually, we can have multiple knowledge bases added into Folio as well. Um, it is designed from the ground up to support that, thinking you may need multiple knowledge bases, maybe a music knowledge base or anything like that. And so here we can see um, um, records that was able to retrieve from the external knowledge base, in this case, EBSCOs, or also taking a look at what exists here locally in inventory or in the catalog. And any one of these I can click on and uh, it can take me to that record so I can take a look at it in more detail and edit it if I need to. Um, I can, there's also quite a bit of um, setup and configuration in Folio. This is of course an area of active development and um, Folio is designed from the ground up or at least based on this concept of microservices. So it's made of um, pieces and parts that are all replaceable. So if need be, for instance, a new cataloging app can be added or the cataloging app can be replaced and this can happen without breaking everything else, which is really kind of unique in at least the library world right now. And to give you an idea what some of that looks like, at least from the technical perspective, is these are the different applications and services that make up the folio functionality that we just saw. And um, so for instance, um, information uh, like the inventory manager, um, you'll somewhere in here, we'll see um, pieces of circulation, circulation module itself, the storage module, um, we did a search in Codex, for instance, here's the Codex multiplexer, um, the wrapper for inventory to make it plug in like other um, knowledge bases would, um, the inventory module itself, storage module as well. Here's how we've connected um, EBSCO's knowledge base in this particular case. Um, though there's another one in process being built um, that able, allows us to plug in GoKB. And ideally in the longer run, we'd also like to see other vendors' knowledge bases plug in here as well. All of these pieces can be replaced and they can do this without breaking anything else within the system. We have some basic settings here. Um, so for instance, an in inventory where we're able um, to create um, the different contributor types that might be needed when we're creating records from scratch, um, the different format types as well. Um, these can be modified and changed it as well. Uh, status types for instances or title records, um, resource types as well. Um, we're able to create uh, different loan types as needed material types as needed, and um, different um, URL relationships as well. Um, for users, um, we have the different address types. Um, we can create as many new address types as we need um, for users or patrons within the system. And as you add them, they appear in the editor when you go ahead and edit those patrons. Um, we're able to create different patron groups, which you saw me use as a filter within the system, but also helps us um, collect the different permission sets that allow access to Folio as well. Um, permission sets, where we're able to go in and create and where I'm able to add different permissions. Whoops. Um, And for instance, I can give anyone that belongs or that I assign this permission set a grouping, for instance, of checking in, um, of renewing, and so on. Sort of like a shortcut, so to speak, for permissions within the system. Um, profile pictures. Um, this is functionality that's not yet complete. But whenever the patron, for instance, is scanned in um, circulation, we'll be able to display the pictures. Um, uh, configuration relating to fees and fines. Um, for instance, do we require comments when the fee or fine is fully or partially paid? Um, so on. Um, any configuration relating to manual charges. Um, uh, the owners, um, which, um, well, I'm not going to get into owners, but we can configure payment methods um, as well. And so, for instance, if I need a new one, um, I don't know, say credit card, 
Um, do we allow refunds? Um, but I'm not going to do that. And as many of these can be created, refund reasons and reasons for waiving. Um, data importing is still early. Um, there's not really anything to show here. Um, E-holdings where we can set up and configure the external knowledge bases and proxies. Um, orders, this work is just starting in the setup and configuration. With circulation, where we're able to actually set up um, loan policies. And so for instance, one hour loan policies, um, I can go in um, and edit all the details about this as well. Um, is it rolling or fixed? Um, uh, the loan period, is it hourly? Or for instance, is it days, weeks, months, what have you, and what that period is? Um, is it based on a fixed due date or not? Um, and this sort of goes on for renewals and so on. Um, if the standard loan policies don't cut it, there is um, a loan rules editor, which in a sense is almost like a script where you can define very detailed and involved um, rules, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, we can set up fixed date due schedules for the system as well. And I can create as um, many of these as I need to. Um, your end, and I can, for instance, Let's say from here to December and have everything default to a particular due date. Let's say January 4th and I can create multiples of these as well. I'm not going to save that. Um, there's some basic profile information that is um, being built out here for setup and configuration, mainly revolving around changing passwords and users getting emails so they can reset their own passwords. Um, organization um, information, such as language and localization. Um, uh, Folio is designed from the ground up to be multilingual. Um, uh, setting up SSO or single sign-on, your identity provider, and configuring service points within the library as well, or as many as you need to, and setting up institutions, campus libraries, and locations, and that structure as well. Um, so for instance, um, uh, the institution, the campus, um, a particular library, and then different locations and creating locations that I might need. Um, Foley also has tagging, which I didn't show, um, but tagging um, will, you'll be able to apply really to anything, to patron records, to item holdings, instance records. Um, right now, it's just rolling out for um, patrons and also for funds within the finance pieces of acquisitions. And that's essentially it in terms of details for Folio. Um, let me look for some questions here. We do have a couple in chat. Yes. The first one is the is based on the uh, inventory app. Is the title search a left anchored search in inventory? Um, I have to be honest. I'm not sure what left anchored actually means. Um, I apologize for that. Um, Judith, is there any chance maybe you can respond with a little bit of clarification on that one um, so I can attempt to answer it a little better? <laughs> um, in the meantime, um, will Folio develop the ability to run an overlap analysis between the library's electronic holdings? Um, yes, it is, and there are definitely plans to do that. Um, right now, there's um, a, a project um, based in Bremen in Germany um, where they're actually um, right now building out um, usage data um, analysis for e-resources, and then there's another team in Germany that's building out um, some of the uh, ERM functionality um, relating to agreements and licensing as well. 
And we believe once those are in place, the next step is going to be to um, start to work on whatever is required to generate those types of reports. Okay, so the left anchored search, um, and so I have a better explanation here, is um, for the example where I was searching for survival, is this the first word in the results? Um, so um, I have to be honest, I don't know the details um, if that is absolutely slated on the roadmap or not. Right now, what you saw is actually a simple search, and we're currently in the process of implementing an advanced search that allows actual parentheses, Boolean operators, and everything else. There are a few areas in Folio that actually allow it right now, but there are others that aren't. And so I believe an extension of that, most likely a next round, will be to allow um, what I guess would be left anchored searching as well. Um, Will users be able to manage their own accounts? Yes, um, they will. Um, that's current, um, it's especially a requirement right now, um, uh, I believe uh, in the EU as it relates to GDPR. And we're currently um, in the process of building out some of the API functionality to surface that to external systems. Folio is being built from the ground up without a discovery service or I guess OPAC, so to speak, because the belief is that a library should be able to choose whichever system they want, need, and use. And that could be an existing system. And so for instance, um, ViewFind um, is actively in getting that integrated into Folio. Um, EBSCO is actively involved in getting EDS integrated with Folio as well. And um, in fact, um, uh, it already is able to connect and get status information about items that exist in inventory. Um, it does allow um, a user to, for instance, renew an item. Um, we're working on holds as well. But the next step from there, we'll be able to create the interfaces that are required so users can manage that information on their own, as well as based on GDPR, for example, go in and take a look at what does the system actually have in terms of past history as far as what they've done in the system and also really asking for the ability to be forgotten within the system as well. Um, what isn't entirely clear right now is will Folio itself provide that self-service user interface or will it really only be up to the discovery services that will be connecting to Folio? Um, Another one here is um, regarding Codex. If I'm looking at a title from the EBSCO knowledge base and I edit information about it, is a local change. So um, at this absolute point in time, no. But the only reason I'm answering a no is because right now we're in the process of adding um, package functionality to be able to store package information within the inventory. And that work is currently ongoing. And once that's completed, the plan is where if you select that package that exists um, in EBSCO's knowledge base, if the library chooses to do so, the system can automatically save those titles and basic um, package information as part of inventory as well. Um, and so those should appear and that then from there really sort of fans out to the rest of the system. And there's a question in the Q&A uh, part. Uh, can language be set on a user level? So right now, language cannot be set on the user level, although that is um, uh, a requirement that's in the backlog that's being asked for. Right now, it's being set on the tenant level, um, but that will come in a later version, a later release. Um, any others? Not really seeing anything else. So we got one. Oh, I do see a question. Um, how to join as a vendor? Um, well, 
it's both a simple and complicated answer depending on how you look at it. Um, simply join. I mean, there's no sign up. There's no nothing of the kind. Just choose to get involved. And um, uh, online, if you go to you can join the community. And here you can sign up for actual updates, but also um, if you take a look, um, wow, this site just changed. Here are different ways that we would like to see you get involved. But more importantly, if you go to the wiki, wiki dot whoops that was not intended if you go to wiki.folio.org here's really the basis that really fans out into anything relating to the community that you are interested in or might want to get involved in and so for instance you can play with the different demo sites there's a ux prototype Here's information about downloading and running the software yourself. Um, getting started guide for developers, which is critical if that's something you're interested in doing. Here's documents relating to the overall project, um, how it's run, information about the backlog, community resources, and so on. Here are also the different special interest groups that are open to everyone and anyone that wants to get involved. Um, if you take a look at these, for instance, in metadata management, here we can take a look and um, see when the next meetings are scheduled, what the agendas are for those meetings. Um, we keep track of um, people who attend, um, as well as any previous and past notes are all accessible from here, and in some cases, recordings as well. So um, you're the whole project is really completely open. And so vendors are strongly encouraged to take part in the special interest groups. And so, you know, you should feel free and that's probably a great place to get started because it'll give you a really good feel as far as what's being discussed, where the project is at, um, where we need help. And then if it turns out you're actually interested in either building features or functionality, providing developers or development team, um, that's certainly something we can help you with in terms of where they can be best used. And you can also inf uh, email info at folio.org to get more information. And um, any other questions? Uh, there's a question about reports. What about reports? Okay, so Folio is designed um, based on the idea um, or a focus of making use of really a data lake and a data warehouse. And so um, internally, we've got all these services that plug into a core platform and essentially they're all sending messages. And so what happens is um, we've also um, built out a tool. It's actually still under construction, but predominantly working right now, that's able to plug in. And a library is basically able to set up rules as to what data and what messages in the system will a library actually want to report on. And so this little tap, so to speak, once it's configured, is able to then push out data to external services. And so we know we have libraries that are interested, for instance, that have their own data warehousing and reporting systems. They maybe want to use a commercial system or something that's sort of homebrew, open source, whatever it is they've chosen to build. And they're certainly free to do so. And Folio has the tools to be able to push out to those systems. However, there's also a reporting SIG that's um, built up of really a core set of libraries that would like to see maybe more of a standard reference reporting tool as well. And this really represents um, sort of a, um, a standard warehouse that anyone in the community that wants to can use as well. And that's currently under development. Um, they've been able to build um, at least a, a couple of reports, a handful. And I also know we've been able to prove using an external data lake data warehouse, for instance, that's hosted on AWS, we were actually able to, to for example, use BERT to create reports there as well. Um, 
The idea in Folio is to provide a maximum amount of flexibility. Um, we also think this is an area where there might be some differentiation as well. For instance, if you're a library, you choose to host Folio yourself, you have a choice. But if you're a library that maybe chooses to go with a vendor, in many cases, that vendor may um, most likely will set up and configure a reporting solution that is used by that group of libraries as well. Um, as far as the reports that are being created by the community, um, those reports, the idea is those will also become available to really the community at large. Um, I, I don't know if I would say open source reports. I don't know if that really exists, but maybe open access reports might be a better description. So there's a question asking, uh, what is the roadmap for managing serials and periodicals? So um, as, as serials and periodicals. So um, right now, um, within at least inventory, the, the focus has really been on the monograph aspects, but that's starting to move over as that gets nailed down. Um, I mentioned packages and I mentioned titles and those titles represent journals. Um, and there is nothing here in folio that implies that serials have to be electronic. These serials and these tools are being built to support both electronic and print. Um, and both can be handled within the system. Um, fairly soon, we're about to start on receiving. And so in addition to receiving monographs, we'll be able to receive serials as well. Um, that's part of the equation. Um, early on in Folio, we made a conscious decision to call what Folio is doing resource management and to not call it ERM or any of these other things because ideally we're trying to blur the distinction between all the different material types. And so within inventory, you should be able to track all of it all in one place. Same thing with acquisitions. And to be honest, um, uh, the group that's building out um, um, Agreements, for example, in Germany, uh, the ultimate goal is those agreements should be able to be used, whether it's print or electronic or serials or monographs or whatever, because oftentimes agreements are used for all of those things. So um, I think I just got a question about China. Um, are there any future activities in China? Um, there are activities in China. Um, I'm not the best person to talk to. I know there is a meeting going on, um, roughly almost the equivalent of maybe a user group meeting. And I believe that's happening this month. Um, there's an organization there, Callus, um, that represents a very large number of libraries. Um, they are starting to get involved in tensions of making use of folio in China. Um, but um, I don't have a lot of details as far as what that looks like and what their plans are, at least not yet. Um, so uh, multi-part items um, are supported. Um, development work has been going on in that area. Um, as far as equipment, there is um, one of the things we've done with Folio is we've set up um, an innovation grant. And uh, what happens is different libraries and organizations can submit ideas and if they get chosen, um, uh, the project can provide a grant for work um, to get done, to be built. And one of those is um, University of um, Illinois, um, Urbana, I believe. And they are um, working on a, um, an equipment uh, management system for Folio. And it's really kind of interesting because it ties into mobile usage, meaning when a user comes up to actually, for example, borrow a piece of equipment, um, oftentimes the library has a document they'd like to have them sign off on, letting them know basically if you damage this piece of equipment, you're responsible or what have you. And so the system's able to push out that document or request that signing from the user on their actual mobile device. And that's something that's been in development. I believe on one of the next or upcoming Folio forums, a demonstration is going to be provided for that system. 
So will resource manage be able to manage shelf locations um, for closed stacks or special collections? Yes, it will. Um, we are able to create locations down to not just the library, but for instance, service points within the library and to be able to track, um, for instance, how much time might be required, for example, when something is received at a particular service point. Um, but those locations can actually go further and down to an actual shelf location as well. Um, the final implementation in the setup and configuration that I was showing you doesn't quite have that yet, but that's something that's upcoming. Um, let me see, is there anything else? I think you're all caught up. Okay. In that case. Oh, we just got another one. I'm done. Q &A. Oh. You got one in the Q&A. Does Folio have a way for users to search only print materials and not electronic ones? Um, yes, it does. Um, there's a series of filters. As long as the metadata has the correct information, it certainly can. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, I showed a little bit of Codex where I was actually able to search local inventory as well as an external knowledge base. And more often than not, that external knowledge base will be e-resources as well. And you can certainly filter that way also. Okay. Well, so I'll say that this concludes today's Folio Forum covering the roadmap. We've been live tweeting the forum. For a short recap and links to resources, look for the Folio underscore LSP Twitter feed. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted to YouTube shortly. Our next Folio Forum is tentatively scheduled for December 5th on the topic of the communities within the Open Library Foundation and their connections to Folio. The announcements to register will be sent out in the Folio newsletter and on various listservs. You can also find it in the events section of the folio.org homepage. Thank you to our speaker, Harry Kaplanian, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Thank you.